So I am going to Italy and I want to kind of take you with me. So let me explain a little bit about the concept of these episodes because they're going to be a little bit different uh, and I'm excited about them. I think they're going to be really fun. Uh, I mentioned I'm going to Italy. I'm, I'm going to Italy on my honeymoon uh, to Florence, Rome and Cinque Terre, which is a sort of a group of five coastal towns. Um, but in particular in Florence, uh, I am just inordinately excited about visiting the Uffizi Gallery and looking at some of the art that they have there um, and visiting this, this home of really the you know, the birth of the Italian Renaissance. And it occurred to me as I was getting ready to go on this trip uh, that the episodes which will air while I'm on it um, could deal with some of the stuff that, you know, I'll be experiencing over there so that we can share that a little bit. And it also occurred to me that we have not talked uh, as much as I would like about visual art. Uh, I've gotten a lot of requests to do more of that visual art and music, um, and I wanted to honor that. And I also wanted to incorporate visual art into kind of the panoramic view that we are starting to assemble on this show of, you know, how the West um, has developed over time, how the different cultures within it have uh, interacted and grappled with one another. Um, and I thought it would be a really great opportunity to kind of focus in uh, on Florence specifically, because it is this place of uh, just crucial importance in how we understand the history, especially of the Renaissance um, and Renaissance art. But, you know, in that way, it becomes really kind of the hinge of modernity in, uh, you know, it, it, if, if you want to put it that way, it becomes this kind of link between the medieval period, the so-called dark ages, which as we we're going to get into here, we're not all that dark at all. Um, but the, you know, the so-called dark ages and this rebirth of classical learning, of humanism, um, the advent of modern science, now kind of a, a spotted history at best. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, themes that emerge that uh, motivated all of that and that motivated the development of this new form of art. Because whatever else you're going to say about it, however much you might want to reclaim the Middle Ages or, you know, say, well, it wasn't really all that dark at all, um, nevertheless. Less, right? It's undeniable that something new happened during this time. And it's also undeniable, I think, that it happened at least in and around Tuscany, which is a region in Italy, um, at, which contains Florence, although it also has a number of other cities, Arezzo and Siena. Um, and this is an area, sort of, if you imagine the boot of Italy, right, which juts uh, in, a, in a north, no, right? If you imagine the boot jutting in a south easterly direction, um, then you kind of travel up the boot, you go northwest until you reach kind of the coast and um, in, in the upper half of Italy. And you can look it up on a map. It's like a chunk of, of Italy. Uh, northwestern coast. And it's this region that has uh, given birth to an astounding, I mean, you could, you could, I could sit here and just list for you, you know, especially in Florence, the people that we've talked about who have passed through, who had important, you know, uh, moments, pivotal, pivotal moments in their career happened there. I mean, you know, Dante, Machiavelli, the Medici, these, and, and now these, uh, painters that we're going to talk about just endless, especially during these, uh, you know, the sort of 1200s to 500s period, um, the Dugento up to the Cinquecento. This is sometimes in, in Italian history, instead of saying like 15, 16, 17th century, we we describe them in the terms of the 300s, the 400s, etc. And so that's what, you know, the Dugento is the 200s or the 1200s, I should say. Um, and that's where, you know, we, we start to get into some of this stuff that we're going to talk about. But we in order to work our way up there, uh, I want to focus on this kind of pivotal question of like, how and why does Renaissance painting, this incredible new thing, this lifelike form where, where people almost reach out off of the canvas or off of the wall and, and communicate the emotional inner truth of the Christian story uh, to viewers, right? How does this kind of just spring into being? Um, and, and is it magic? Does the, is there some sort of historical cause of it? Um, and that question, I think, is really urgent for us because we are in what looks like a kind of uh, period of decline to me, right? It looks as if much of our art is kind of sterile um, and a little bit lifeless. It's sort of, it feels as if we've exhausted a lot of our kind of uh, 
stock forms like the Marvel Cinematic Universe is just this sort of rehashing of old superhero type stories. And we're constantly doing all these remakes and movies and all of these, you know, nostalgia trips in, in uh, TV. And that looks to me very much like what happens when an art form kind of reaches a, a breaking point, reaches a point where the, the whole all the possibilities of the form are sort of exhausted. That's how I feel sort of about movies and TV now. And it is how the Byzantine style of art, the kind of uh, more flat mosaic style that you see in those Byzantine churches, um, that's what had happened. Whether you like that style or not, it had sort of exhausted its possibilities. And so we, I think, in the modern day could really care a lot about, well, how does a, a culture move out of that moment and into this kind of renaissance, this reflowering, this rebirth? There's a lot of different strands to that. It's going to take us a while to get through it. Um, but let's get started and let's uh, talk, introduce our guide uh, through this journey, who is a fellow named Giorgio Vasari. The Ancient Language Institute is such a valuable service because it really is the key to getting deeper into some of the texts we talk about on this show. Some of the most profound ones and the ones that stand really at the fountainhead of many of these literary traditions. Um, it's a great uh, institution in particular because it teaches these ancient languages, Biblical Hebrew, Latin, and Ancient Greek, um, as if they were living languages. So sometimes people can get very intimidated by the notion of learning something like Latin because they think they're going to have to just sit down and memorize these kind of dry tables of conjugation and vocabulary just totally out of context. Um, and sometimes that is how these languages are taught, but not at ALI. ALI gets you reading as quickly as possible and even speaking these languages from day one. Uh, so when you go to ancientlanguage.com slash heretics, it's ancientlanguage.com slash heretics, you can get a 10% discount on tuition with the promo code heretics. You can read the Bible in its original languages, the great Athenian philosophers, the golden age of poetry in Rome. Um, we're uh, reading some Virgil here on Young Heretics. That's somebody you could read if you uh, checked out ALI. Go to ancientlanguage.com slash heretics and use the promo code heretics for 10% off. So as we are traveling through Italy together, or rather through uh, Tuscany together and, and uh, describing the history of the beginning, the birth of the Renaissance. Um, I wanted to introduce to you this Gafella who's going to be like, you know, the best tour guide ever. Um, this is the guy that sort of seems to know everybody and have an anecdote about everything. Um, Giorgio Vasari from uh, lives in the in the 16th century, right? So the Cinquecento um, was himself a painter and an architect, um, but composed what remains this kind of original work of art history. There had been a few attempts, you know, in antiquity, as we'll we'll soon discuss, us, you know, people like Pliny the Elder had kind of cataloged uh, great works of art and great artists. Um, and, you know, you, you have people like Lorenzo Giberti, uh, who had written a kind of, you know, artistic bi autobiography. Um, but this is the first attempt to put together a kind of story about how art developed over time. And it begins in uh, the 1200s in the Dugento, uh, which is kind of what we're going to be building up to um, and moves all the way up to Vasari's day. And Vasari's project is kind of to assemble, you know, it's called the lives because it's a series of little biographical sketches, little character sketches um, that tell the story not only of the uh, individuals and the paintings that they made, but their character and how that informed their personal development, how that intersected with the course of history and this kind of grand theory going all the way back to antiquity of how art comes to be and dies. Um, and like many histories from this period, uh, it's been shown to be kind of riddled with all sorts of inventions and even inaccuracies. And we're going to mention some of those as we go. Um, and yet, nevertheless, right, one of the most interesting things about it, given that it has some of these sort of uh, fanciful tales, some some uh, some urban legends, it's sort of like a Herodotus in that way. You get some stuff that you sort of think, well, that can't possibly be exact. It's like too good to really be true. Um, and then some things that actually definitely aren't true uh, or are borrowed from elsewhere. Right. Um, and yet, nevertheless, it tells this extremely compelling and I would argue overall accurate story about how how art comes to be, uh, how, how artists get inspired, how new forms of art develop, um, and how the Renaissance comes into being. Vasari essentially invents the term Renaissance. Um, he calls, obviously, he calls it a rinascita because he's writing in Italian, uh, and that means rebirth. Um, and this is picked up by Jules Michelet, who's a French guy. I mean, this is why we get, you know, the, the Renaissance in the, in the 19th century. Um, but it's Vasari who has this idea, and it's very similar to an idea that, you know, uh, we talked about uh, Petrarch having before him, 
back when we talked about Petrarch, we talked about this idea of, you know, resurrection. How is it that the West was, was resurrected as Petrarch is traveling through Rome and meditating upon classical history and whether it can really be united with, with Christian thought and so forth? Um, you know, similar concept in Vasari, this notion that there are... Uh, truths from antiquity, uh, aspects of wisdom from antiquity um, that have been essentially lost. And Vasari is very frank about this, that have been lost in the Christian uh, sort of reclamation of the world. And as Christianity transformed the world, I mean, Vasari is, is a Christian, it believes in God, um, and yet he is really kind of scathing, and we'll get there, uh, about, you know, how the Christian church in its enthusiasm for wiping out idols, for kicking out the pagan world, right? in that uh, passion, it, it actually destroyed a lot of uh, ancestral inherited knowledge that was already passing out of the world to begin with because of the barbarian conquest of Rome. And I mean, this is, you can see how this story is so sweeping um, that it, it kind of grabs up a lot of stuff that we like to talk about. So let's, let's get into it uh, before I kind of scoop too much more. And I'm going to read to you from uh, a, a early passage in, in Vasari um, that kind of gives us a flavor for his vision of how art comes into being. And that's uh, going to this this week. What we're going to talk about is sort of how that uh, was preceded, what the precedents were for that in the ancient world um, and why it might be that those precedents, which had kind of been lost or eclipsed in the Byzantine period, um, why those precedents kind of coming back to life during this period of, of the Renaissance. So I'm reading here from a translation uh, by Gaston du Cet de Verre, uh, which is a, a modern library translation of the lives. This is a really snackable book. Uh, it's just so much fun to have around. And you don't have to read some of those ones. You don't have to read the whole thing all at once. You can kind of dip in and out if you want to know about a specific artist. Um, but one of the things I want to draw out, at least as we talk about the opening passages of, of the lives, um, is that uh, even though it's kind of something, it's a nice handbook to have around, um, it's also a complete story that is, you know, has a kind of overarching vision and, and project. Uh, and so uh, let me just read to you. So there are three parts uh, to the lives which correspond in Vasari's mind to sort of three stages of the development of art. And he thinks that these three stages come up wherever art is sort of born. Um, that that when, when the, you know, the great modern style is discovered, it sort of echoes this ancient uh, process that happened also in Greece, where art goes through the, the moment of birth, right, where it's discovered. Um, and that's going to be as we as we get up to talking about these artists like Cimabue and Giotto. Um, and then it goes through also a kind of period of refinement. That's, that's the second age. And then an, a period of perfection. And that's the third age. And for uh, Vasari, that's up to like Michelangelo and the big, you know, heavy hitters of the Renaissance. Um, and, and so here's what uh, Vasari has to say at the very beginning. This is the preface to the whole thing, um, at, starting on, on, you know, at, at the opening about how this stuff kind of comes back to life out of nothing. He says, I have no manner of doubt that it is with almost all writers a common and deeply fixed opinion that sculpture and painting together were first discovered by the light of nature by the people of Egypt, and that there are certain others who attribute to the Chaldeans the first rough sketches in marble and the first reliefs in statuary, even as they also give to the Greeks the invention of the brush and of coloring. But I will surely say that of both one and the other of these arts, the design, which is their foundation, nay, rather, the very soul that conceives and nourishes within itself all the parts of man's intellect, was already most perfect before the creation of all other things, when the Almighty God, having made the great body of the world, and having adorned the heavens with their exceeding bright lights, descended lower with his intellect into the clearness of the air and the solidity of the earth, and shaping man, discovered, together with the lovely creation of all things, the first form of sculpture, from which man afterwards, step by step, and this may not be denied, as from a true pattern, there were taken statues, sculptures, and the science of pose and of outline. And for the first pictures, whatsoever they were, softness, harmony, and the concord and discord that comes from light and shade. Wow, what an opening, man. They knew how to open a, a treatise in those days. You know, there's a funny meme online if you go on Twitter, and I've, I've found it in a couple different places. And it's a joke about graduate students. So the idea is that, you know, a graduate PhD thesis in 2022 
is like, here is a small, tiny addition that I made to an already established field backed up with reams and reams and decades and decades of documentary sources. Please, you know, don't find even the smallest uh, thing to object to. I promise I'm only making a modest addition, right? Um, that's the graduate student of today. And the graduate student of like, you know, 1765 is like, you know, his PhD is here are some thoughts I had in the bathtub. They constitute immutable and eternal laws for all humanity. Um, and and there is a lot of truth to this. Like you go back and you read somebody like Vasari and he's really swinging for it, right? He's taken a swing uh, to kind of tell you the whole story and the whole comprehensive theory of life, the universe and everything and where art fits into it. And to be honest with you, I sort of prefer this model. Um, not that it's not valuable to make kind of incremental additions to a science with a, you know, a long history and so forth. Um, but we've lost, I think, that sense that you can pull back the camera and you can make big statements. There are always going to be exceptions. Um, but comprehensive visions of things help us to understand, right, what, what individual painters and paintings and, and events mean. That's the point of them. And um, so I love this grand theory. And I actually think it's it's quite profound because, you know, he says the Egyptians maybe were the first artists. This is a, an old idea. You know, Plato plays with it all the time that the Egyptians are, are the really ancient civilization from back before the Greeks, you know. Um, and at one point in, in the Timaeus, when Solon, the great Greek sage, visits the Egyptians, the Egyptian sages say to him, oh, you Greeks, you're all children in your soul because you have no cultural memory. Um, and so this idea that the Egyptians are like the ancients of the ancients is very, very old. Um, and so Vasari is kind of using that. He's saying, well, somewhere back in like, you know, the, the mists of time, um, people, you know, began to do art. And there's all sorts of developments that have happened since then. You know, maybe the Greeks were kind of pioneers in painting or in drawing. Um, with the brush, he says, and we're, we'll get into some of this also. Um, but, you know, the, the the profound moment in Vasari, which I think will inform almost everything that we say from here on out, right, is where he makes this flip and he says, yeah, you know, from a certain point of view, art develops from these rudiments and gradually people make improvements. And you start with like, you know, a, a modern version of this story might be like you start with cave paintings and then gradually the cave paintings become more sophisticated and eventually you start to see this development. Um, but it was all already perfect when God created the universe um, and mankind is the ultimate sculpture. And this is taken right out of scripture when he says this, because of course, you know, the, the Hebrew way of talking, one of the many Hebrew ways of talking about God's creation of man is as the potter, right? Who sculpts the clay. And Paul picks this up in his letter to the Romans. This is a, again, you know, an idea with an ancient pedigree um, that God is the supreme artist. And it's not even, you know, limited to Judeo-Christian scripture. We could talk about the Timaeus, right? Plato's Timaeus, in which um, there is this kind of one demiurge, right? This craftsman um, who's like a kind of, uh, you know, he's like a, um, a smith at the forge, right? Or he's like a painter with a grand design. He has this kind of image in his mind, um, which is cashed out in, in Aristotle, right? In this notion of the kind of formal cause, right? The, why does a flower develop the way that it is? Well, because it is such and such a kind of thing. Um, and and this created universe, which already has a perfect picture of things, right, is essential in order to tell any story about artistic progress. And this is something that when you think about it makes perfect sense. But it's the kind of thing that's so unpopular or kind of cringy to say in 21st century America um, that it's very easy to lose lose track of this. The very notion that there's such a thing as like, you know, good, better and best art, that art could develop in a positive direction, you know, and, and, and perfect and become perfect perfect, right? Or perfect itself or reach more perfection. All of this depends on the notion that before any artist picks up any brush or hammers any, you know, block of 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 marble. Um, there exists in some pure mind the the perfection of form and order and truth and beauty um, that we are all kind of aspiring to. And that's why art can be a mimesis, right? It can be not just kind of a random thing that happens to look pretty, or not just you know the thing that some someone happens to throw at a wall, the spaghetti that we throw at a wall, and the marks that it makes, um, but actually a kind of insight, right? This, this apocryphal story that we get, um, it's not just attributed to Michelangelo, but also to some Eastern painters as well and sculptors, you know, that how do you paint, uh, or rather, how do you carve a tiger? Well, you start with a block of wood or a block of marble and you carve away everything that doesn't look like a tiger. 
And this is the, the fundamental kind of idea in Vasari is that because we have this uh, Christian notion that the universe is divinely ordered and that there is harmony and proportion and form and reason in it, right, um, which we might also attribute to the Stoics too, right, that there's like a logos flowing through creation, through the material world. It's not just gunk and stuff that we move around. It actually has a form um, and it has a plan and an ordered shape, right? All of that is essential if you're going to say like, well, what are artists doing? doing, um, they're not just messing around and they're, it's not just, you know, are aesthetically neutral what they do. They're actually trying to convey something. They're trying to reflect the universe back at itself because the universe it's, in itself has a plan, is the product of a mind because we are minds in God's image, right? We reflect that, that uh, order and that harmony, proportion, form, beauty, grace, right? All of these things back at the universe when we sculpt things in marble, when we paint things, when we draw things, right? Um, and so this fundamental fundamental idea about what makes good art is the linchpin, right, that enables Vasari to even tell a story at all. The whole notion of art history, right, which he's basically inventing in real time, is a theological notion. And what's so fascinating to me about this is it's the same idea that's going to underpin the birth of science, right? Because, of course, now we think of science as this, uh, you know, aggressively secular force um, that just kind of uh, debunks all supernatural ideas. But it was not that initially in conception at all. I mean, you know, there there was a kind of, you know, enlightenment skepticism that, that creeped in, uh, and that was part of the idea that, you know, we, we're going to try to get to just what we can know ourselves objectively through reason. Um, but there's also, of course, a, a strong historical strain in Newton, for instance, right, of believing that the world can be understood because it is the product of a mind, right? Because if it's not the product of a mind, then why should we assume that our minds would have any kind of, you know, rational way of grasping it or giving it order or describing the order in it, right? And so in this way, Renaissance art and the kind of development of modern science spring out of very much the same impulse. And that is the kind of light bulb that goes on where you're saying, well, okay, if, if the cosmos is divinely ordered by one great mind, um, then human minds in the image of that of, of that great mind, right, have a kind of job to do, which is discovering and affirming and giving kind of vision to reflecting that universe, that divinely ordered universe back at itself. And so now we have a foothold because we have a standard, right? When, when you have some kind of touchstone, some idea of an absolute um, or a, a standard against which things are measured, um, something that the Greeks might have called the criterion, right, the, the touchstone of, of truth and, and beauty, then you can start to make these, tell these stories about the development of art, for instance, right? And the way that uh, certain forms of wisdom were gained and lost. And so that's what I want to go into next is this is Vasari's idea and kind of some of our ideas uh, about how the, these, these notions of divine truth and artistic representation took hold in antiquity, in ancient Greece, and uh, to a lesser extent, it must be said, in ancient Rome. If you run a small business and you're hiring, you need Indeed. I can highly recommend this service to you because it will take a lot of the hassle out of finding good people. It's such an important part of any business, making sure you have people that you like to work with, who are good at what they do, who are passionate about your vision. And especially in a small business, you got into it for a reason, right? There's something that you love doing, some sort of service that you're providing to the world. Um, and you want people that can get on board with that. Um, and what you don't want to be doing is to sit around forever reading a million applications when you only need one, right? You only need the great like five or six that are going to like get you your, your candidates. Um, and indeed finds those for you. They are the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It's the only job site where you are guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. This is such an important service. We use it here at Soundfront for a lot of the team that uh, makes these shows. Um, and as you can tell, they do a great job. Not me, of course, but they do a great job. Uh, when you go to indeed.com slash heretics, you can get a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post. It's indeed.com slash heretics. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire. You need Indeed. So as I mentioned, Vasari tells this story of the sort of three ages of art, right? The, the birth, the development and the perfection. Um, and we might sort of helpfully think about this in an Aristotelian way. Um, and when we say perfection, right, what we what we mean is completeness, right? Uh, this is, a, again, something I've stressed before on the show that, you know, that line in the Bible, be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. That sounds so daunting, like, oh, how am I ever going to be like morally perfect? And the answer is 
is the concept somewhat different, right? The word in Greek is teleos, which comes from telos. And telos is your goal, right? What are you made for? Um, and so, yeah, in this, this side of paradise, we never attain that perfection. Um, but the idea of the telos, like the idea of the criterion, of the standard, gives us some way of measuring our kind of eternal ascent toward that goal. Um, and so the perfection of art is sort of like that. This is the idea that Vasari has, that this, this stuff kind of um, gradually emerges out of the, the muck of history, um, but it, it's refined and refined and refined until it reaches the thing that it was always meant to be, because again, the, the perfect vision is in God's mind. Um, and so this is where we get into this idea of, of nature, right? Art from nature, uh, because nature here, right, is not just the physical, like, you know, grass and trees, although it is that. It's also the uh, inherent order of things, the, na the nature of how the trees grow, right? The order that is in them, the proportion and form and harmony that God has invested in creation. Um, so here's what Vasari has to say about both the Greeks and the, uh, you know, for, for him, the moderns, that is to say the, um, you know, Renaissance Italians. He says, since the dates of the works of the Greeks, the Ethiopians, and the Chaldeans are as doubtful as our own, and perhaps more, and by reason of the greater need of founding our judgment about these works on conjectures, which, however, are not so feeble that they are in every way wide of the mark, I believe that I strayed not at all from the truth, and I think that everyone who will consent to consider this question discreetly will judge as I did when I said above that the origin of these arts was nature herself and the example or model, the most beautiful fabric of the world, and the master, that divine light infused by special grace into us, which has not only made us superior to the other animals, but, if it be not sin to say it, like to God. And if in our own times it has been seen, as I trust to be able to demonstrate a little later by many examples, that simple children, roughly reared in the woods, he's thinking here, and we're going to get there in later episodes, he's thinking here of, of Giotto and how he was discovered by Cimabue, right? roughly reared in the woods with their only model, the beautiful pictures and sculptures of nature, and by the vivacity of their wit, have begun by themselves to make designs. How much more may we, nay, must we confidently believe that these primitive men, who in proportion as they were less distant from their origin and divine creation, were thereby the more perfect and of better intelligence, that they by themselves, having for guide nature, for master purest intellect, and for example the so lovely model of the world, gave birth to these most noble arts, and from a small beginning, little by little bettering them, brought them at last to perfection. So he's saying, you know, we have these kind of shady histories of, of antiquity and, and of the past. Um, and we have, you know, kind of uncertain dates even in our own day. But uh, we can intuit uh, that there was a kind of golden age. There was an Edenic past also um, in which mankind sort of developed the perfect art out of just relationship to nature. And again, the reason for that is that nature itself, right, um, is God's handiwork. And the human mind, right, is the capstone of God's handiwork that plays God's role on earth. And in art, right, we're even doing kind of what God does in, in miniature. And this is why it gives delight, right? This is why it not only moves, but also instructs. And this, I, I've mentioned this kind of trifecta on the show before, and it's actually what Cicero says about rhetoric. Um, but we could, we could very reasonably kind of uh, say it also about all forms of art that, it, you know, in its ideal form, it, moere, it can moere docere, um, and delectare. It can move, delight, and instruct. So not only do we see the truth in art and learn about the nature of the world and the structure of human emotions and so forth, um, but that uh, truth that we see gives us pleasure. Aristotle says this, that seeing good representations in Mimesis gives us pleasure. Um, and that's why we love to look at art, even if it's, it deals with difficult or ugly subjects. Um, and, you know, and it moves us, right? It's emotional because that's part of the truth that it's conveying. The core of the truth that it's conveying is the truth of our our inner lives, of the emotional uh, sort of movements of the soul. Um, and this is key to uh, Vasari's story about the development of art, too, that as these technical improvements get made, um, as, as painters get better and better at reproducing reality, um, it enables them to invest their pictures of, of physical reality um, with movements and facial expressions and kind of grace that, that uh, it captures the inner life of what's going on, which is the kind of 
that is the summit of art, as we're going to, to get into, is not just to be able to mechanically reproduce physical stuff. Um, and in fact, he faults some artists for spending too much time, right, working on things like perspective. He says about Paolo Uccello that he just, you know, was so obsessed with mathematical proportion that he kind of missed out on some of the emotional realities and his figures got too wooden. Um, and so this part of this perfection has to do with kind of adding this final capstone of humanity to things, right, of the human soul, which is the kind of key to it all, that as you are building up your, your technical perfection um, from, from the kind of the ground up, you're also doing that so that your, your physical capacities can meet with your spiritual essence, right? Can meet with your spiritual uh, discernment uh, as see, of seeing the kind of emotional truth in the, you know, whatever scene you're painting, the visitation, the annunciation, or, uh, you know, the Madonna and child and all these religious scenes, right? Um, and the, that infusion of emotion um, is, is, the kind of capstone of this gradual development of, of technical skill. Um, and he gives, Vasari gives as an example, the first work of art that I'd like us to kind of pay a little attention to. Um, and if this, this is one, these series of episodes, you know, usually I think it's totally fine if you're just listening. Um, and it is still fine if you're just listening, you can look these things up online. They're all available, you know, easily with this incredible, uh, you know, de detail on, on Wikimedia Commons. You can find public domain images of all these works of art. Um, which, by the way, is kind of amazing. Like, I know that I've talked a lot about some of the dangers inherent in our tech, and this is something conservatives do discuss a, a great deal because there does seem to be a kind of degraded philosophy motivating a lot of our technological advancements. Um, but it, it's it, it, it's worth, you know, joy is always worth something. And it's worth pausing, you know, even though it seems kind of like uh, very, very last century and kind of outdated to be like excited about technological development. It's worth pausing to say that like how unbelievable is it that I can read to you from Vasari, you can hear me on a podcast, um, and you can go away and look up, right, these incredibly detailed images of things that you, people might have traveled miles and miles just to see one of these images in the past, right, made huge pilgrimages just to visit and contemplate these, these things. Um, and, you know, yeah, that does mean we can be subject to sensory overload, but it also means that if we take time, like we're doing on this show, right, um, to really contemplate the nature and the history of these things and to, to look at them together, we have unbelievable resources at our disposal. So I don't want to come across as a techno pessimist. I actually have a lot of optimism about tech. Um, but I think that, you know, like everything else, it's our responsibility to exert the formative influence of the soul upon them, right? The tech is just stuff. It's our souls that are going to have to, you know, pick themselves up, dust themselves off, uh, you know, kind of snap out of your slack, or your haze, your stupor uh, as you're scrolling on Twitter and like, look with me at some art. Um, so this is all by way of saying you can also find on YouTube um, my my fabulous producers uh, and editors will help me to put these images onto the YouTube video. So this is one that you may want to check out on YouTube as well, uh, just because it's it's easier to, you know, see these things all at once. So let's talk about the uh, the first work of art that we should we should look at. And this is the Chimera of Bellerophon. Um, and it's an Etruscan bronze. So the Etruscans, we I don't even know if we've ever once mentioned the Etruscans on the podcast, which is sort of funny. Um, but they're these like precursor, uh, pre precursor uh, civilization to the Romans. Uh, and the Romans sort of look at them that way. And they have uh, a really kind of rich artistic culture. And uh, Vasari makes mention of the fact that one of the things that's happening in Italy at this time is all of these big public works are going on. The, the Christian church is ordering the construction of, church, of you know, new churches and basilicas and so forth. And patronage is emerging. So even secular patrons are dedicating churches or, you know, having buildings built. Um, and as they're digging up the earth for the foundations, um, they're like stumbling on these treasures, these masterworks of, of Western art and Western history. Um, and this is one of the things that happens is in uh, Arezzo, which is a, a, a Tuscan city. Um, they're making ditches and fortifications. So they're digging right into the ground and they stumble across this Etruscan chimera. Now, Bellerophon is the hero who rides Pegasus. So he's kind of well known in Greek uh, mythology. He's maybe one of the guys that you've sort of seen in pop culture. Um, but you maybe have not necessarily encountered the chimera, which is the, the beast he has to kill. Um, and it's this uh, tripartite beast. When we talk about chimeras now, we talk about like dreams, something that's sort of fanciful or extravagant because the chimera itself is so crazy. Um, and and what it is, it's a, it's a tripartite uh, animal, heads of a lion, of a goat, and of a snake. So obviously kind of monstrous. And indeed, the, the original concept of a monstrum 
is this sort of shocking and uh, maybe perverse combination of different parts, right? Uh, or just something that's so out of the ordinary uh, that it, it must be a kind of monstrosity, right? Um, and so that's what the chimera is. It's this monster. And and we can see why Vasari picks it out because of the, uh, the elegance of its forms and the motion that's inherent in this work, right? And this is something that is going to become a theme as we move into the Dugento and the, the Trecento and ta start talking about, you know, 13th and 14th century Italian art um, is motion. Right. The notion that you could portray somebody uh, kind of in action. Uh, and this was something that the uh, Greek painters and sculptors really mastered. I mean, you look at the discus thrower, right? That's the big famous one. Um, and the kind of coil of his body as he's getting ready to throw the discus. Um, we think of these as just, well, of course, this is something that artists can do is they can capture a still frame or whatever. Um, but it takes amazing technical skill to be able to do that. And this chimera has the kind of uh, coiled haunches of a lion as it's getting ready to spring and it's kind of rearing its head back and roaring. Um, and you can kind of almost see the, the tail, uh, which is the snake, right? The snake is like thrashing as it has this sort of other head growing out of it, the goat head, just like, you know, pushing its way, uh, like as if it has just almost burst out of the skin, right? So the movement of it is incredible. And, you know, when Vasari says that this comes from nature, right? Uh, he can't possibly mean that somebody went out and was like, hmm, I'm going to find a chimera today. I mean, I guess he could mean that. He may have believed that these chimeras were around, but I, I think he's a much smarter guy than that. He's not saying like, I went out and I, he went, this guy went out and he painted these different things and just, you know, took the painting home and then made this, this sculpture. Um, what he is saying is that this is, uh, you know, the, the elements of this painting uh, are, are, you know, taken right out of life. And then they have added to them the uh, kind of essential and ineffable ingredient of the human imagination um, and imagination. The ancient philosophers were fond of saying that this is what imagination does. It takes you know, pieces from elsewhere and it combines them and puts them together. Um, and so this is kind of what you've got in this, in this chimera. And it's beautifully illustrated by the fact that it's this imaginary beast, um, which has also been kind of given a certain coherence by the vision of the artist, right? That you can see, you can almost see exactly how it would move if there were such a thing. Um, so it's a stunning piece of art and it tells you kind of what Vasari's ideal is, right? This is why he mentions it is because he's, he's got this idea um, of what we're traveling toward. And that is the meeting of technical skill with uh, human imagination, the human mind, the human ability uh, to see the spiritual realities of the world, things like emotion, right? And, and, and as, when we get to Christianity, salvation, right? These, these things can be kind of imprinted upon the raw materials of earth and dust and matter. Um, and that's just what art is. It's just taking stuff, clay and dirt and paint and egg and oil, right? Um, and kind of mixing it around with that key sort of spiritual vision uh, so that it becomes something divine, something refined and beautiful. Um, it's an amazing kind of uh, object to pick, an amazing object to look at. Um, and I want to talk about one other, you know, piece from antiquity that that during around this same time, the 16th century, um, the, the chimera, I should say, was uncovered in 1553. Um, and, and we should talk also about one other work that's uh, uncovered around the same time, and that is the Laocoon. Um, this is a uh, sort of uh, famous, famous sculpture, which if you look it up or if you're watching on YouTube, I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll have seen it. it comes, it's uncovered in 1506, um, and, and this is in the, the Vatican Museum. So if you're wandering through the Vatican on your way to the, um, to the Sistine Chapel, the famous painted ceiling, uh, this is a you know, famously just kind of famously kind of a slog, um, or, or at least it's very overwhelming. I've done it a couple times and everybody just wants to go see the ceiling, uh, with the Adam and the Michelangelo and all that, you know, uh, but the Vatican, you know, being this enormous seat of kind of cultural and artistic and, and, uh, political power as well as religious influence, of course, right. Um, has accumulated just an unspeakable wealth, like a, just a treasure house of kind of stuff from history. Uh, and so it can be incredibly overwhelming. You can, you can suffer from kind of art blindness. Um, but this, this, uh, sculpture along with a few others, one of which we've talked about, and that's the, um, the Pietà, Michelangelo's Pietà in, uh, St. Peter's. Um, but this is another one of those ones that it's like, even if you're kind of exhausted from your trip through the Vatican, this one will catch your eye because of the same, uh, kind of some of the same elements as this, as this Bellerophon, right? Um, you have, a, 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 almost a still frame, right? Captured, um, in, in mid moment. 
Um, and I, I, I want to, you know, sh show you the sculpture, but I also want to read to you from the kind of literary source that describes the, the story and, and its inspiration, um, because that's going to be another key theme as we move forward through this history, right, is that, um, you know, uh, Horace makes a comparison, a famous comparison between uh, p poetry and art, uh, ut pictura poesis, right, as, as painting um, and, and pictures, so uh, poetry. And this is borne out in, in some of the great kind of interactions between poets and artists. Um, and this is kind of one of the original versions of that. Um, so let me read to you now from Virgil's description. This is in the Aeneid um, of Laocoon and how he was uh, strangled to death by snakes. The sculpture is a sculpture group of Laocoon and his two sons being strangled by snakes. Um, the motion in it, similar to the, even more really than the chimera, um, is the motion is just incredibly powerful, kind of this torque of struggle, the muscles standing out on all of their bodies as the snakes are obviously just, you know, overpowering them. One of them is biting Laocoon's hip. Um, and so the the story goes uh, that Laocoon was uh, punished for telling the truth, for, for uh, encouraging the Trojans to be skeptical of the Trojan horse, the famous Greek subterfuge uh, for invading the, the walls of Troy. So let's read the passage now from uh, from Virgil in which this is described, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the art as, as we move through this history. Here's a translation of the Aeneid that I'm not sure I've uh, read to you before. When we did do the Aeneid back in the day, uh, in, in that episode, I read to you from a bunch of different translations, um, but I can't remember, I don't think I, I read for you from the Fitzgerald translation, and this is actually the one that I used in high school. So I will uh, I will use this one now just so you can get a flavor for um, some of the different possibilities. There, this is a slightly older one than some of the ones I read to you uh, from from earlier, and, and so it has a bit more uh you kind of register a bit a bit more of a kind of uh, regimented um m metric uh tone to it but it's also got you know it's still kind of modern enough that it that it uh it reads well i think so this is remember the trojan horse big wooden horse uh all the Greek soldiers are hiding in it, and it's masquerading as a uh, peace offering that the Greeks have gone away, and they're going to just, you know, um, they're they're going to uh, offer this horse as a symbol of, you know, Poseidon, whose god, whose whose animal is the horse, and like off we go on the sea. But actually, they've just dipped over the horizon, and they've have an advance force hiding in the horse, um, and the Trojans are debating whether to take it in. So we're switching now here to the uh to the from the homeric perspective which is kind of from the greek view of things it's not necessarily all pro achaean in homer but it is you know from the greek point of view uh and now we're switching to the virgilian perspective uh who tells the story of the trojans because the trojans are the mythical founders of what would eventually become rome and so aeneas here uh is looking back on the story of how he fled troy and came to be in carthage with queen dido um and and they've got this uh this horse right which is kind of a, a ruse. It's it's hiding all of these soldiers inside its belly. The Greeks have pretended to be fleeing and they've just gone dipped down across over the horizon um, while they wait to see if the Trojans are going to fall for it and take the bait. Certain notions pulled the crowd apart, says Virgil. Next thing we knew, in front of everyone, Laocoon, with a great company, came furiously running from the height and still far off cried out, Oh, my poor people, men of Troy, what madness has come over you? Can you believe the enemy truly gone? A gift from the Danaeans and no ruse? Is that Ulysses' way as you have known him? Achaeans must be hiding in this timber, or it was built to butt against our walls, peer over them into our houses, pelt the city from the sky. Some crookedness is in this thing. Have no faith in the horse. Whatever it is, even when Greeks bring gifts, I fear them. Gifts and all. This famous line that people even still sometimes cite, right? I, I fear Greeks even bearing gifts, um, is kind of saying, well, I still smell a rat here, even though somebody's making an overture. Uh, and so, of course, we know the, how the story goes. They continue to debate over it. Um, and indeed, Laocoon hurls a spear into it um, to see if it's hollow. Uh, but the gods, nevertheless, have in mind the destruction of Troy, so they do take it in. Um, and Laocoon is punished uh, for speaking the truth. So here's here's that, that scene a little bit later. This is all in book two. And now another sign, more fearful still, broke on our blind, miserable people, filling us all with dread. Laocoon, acting as Neptune's priest that day by lot, was on the point of putting to the knife a massive bull before the appointed altar, when, ah, 
Look there, from Tenedos on the calm sea, twin snakes, I shiver to recall it, endlessly coiling, uncoiling, swam abreast for shore, their underbellies showing as their crests reared red as blood above the swell, behind they glided with great undulating backs, now came the sound of thrashed seawater foaming, now they were on dry land, and we could see their burning eyes, fiery and suffused with blood, their tongues a flicker out of hissing maws, we scattered, pale with fright, but straight ahead, they slid until they reached Laokon. Each snake enveloped one of his two boys, twi twining about and feeding on the body. Next they ensnared the man as he ran up with weapons. Coils like cables looped and bound him twice round the middle. Twice about his throat they whipped their back scales, and their heads towered, while with both hands he fought to break the knots. Drenched in slime, his headbands black with venom, sending to heaven his appalling cries like a slashed bull escaping from an altar. The fumbled axe shrugged off. The pair of snakes now flowed away and made for the highest shrines the citadel of pitiless Minerva, where coiling they took cover at her feet under the ronger of her shield. New terrors ran in the shaken crowd. The word went round. Laokoan had paid, and rightfully, for profanation of the sacred hulk with this offending spear hurled at its flank. This is an amazing passage. It's one of the most famous ones in the Iliad. And uh, in a second, we'll take a look again at the at the sculpture. But just to note, right, that this is uh, not true, right? It's it, so Minerva is punishing him. These are Minerva's snakes. Remember Athena and Juno, kind of on the Greek side. Uh, Juno, famous hater of the Troy of the Trojans and of Troy, uh, will pursue Aeneas throughout the whole Aeneid. Um, but uh, Laocoon was not, uh, you know, profaning something sacred, except that, uh, you know, this this. Uh, I guess this horse was ostensibly sacred to, to Neptune, but it was a trick, right? He was right. Um, and so this is like this kind of tragic view of life that because the gods are in conflict with one another, human beings are kind of caught up ultimately in this chaotic universe. Um, and, and the, you know, the drama of the moment is so beautifully captured in this picture. So let's talk about what this, what this image can kind of tell us as we move forward through the, the history of ancient art. Well, every time I talk about American heart for gold, it seems like inflation is worse than the last time I talked about it. Now we've got 9.1% more even than was predicted. Um, although some of us could have predicted it because, of course, this administration keeps trying to tell you it's not that bad. It really is bad what they're doing. And it's irresponsible the way they're spending. This is not, they do not have your best interests at heart, which means you have to have your best interests at heart. And one of the best ways to protect your money against inflation is to diversify a portion of your portfolio into physical gold and silver. Uh, that is what American Hartford Gold can do. And they will even help you move your existing IRA or 401k out of the stock market into a precious metals IRA. If you call them right now, for Young Heretics listeners, they will give you up to $1,500 worth of free silver on your first qualifying order. That is a great benefit and will accrue a lot of value, I am sure, as time goes by. Don't wait. Call them now or text Heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, to the number 65532. So it's the number 65532. Send them a text just saying the word Heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title, and you can get your $1,500 worth of free silver on the first qualifying order. So look again at this at this sculpture right this sculpture group in the Vatican uh being uncovered right also in the 1500s um and and part of the sense that the sari has uh that that this tradition is not just being born but being reborn right renashita uh it's, it's this and that's where we get renaissance right um this sense that there was something lost in the pagan world uh not necessarily that the pagans were right right the pagans can still have been very wrong uh, about god the universe and that's kind of Ill illustrated in the passage that I just mentioned uh, from, from Virgil. But at the same time, they did have this sense of, you know, the divine mind ordering the cosmos, um, which they developed to a very high degree of sophistication in their culture. Um, and now the fruits of that culture are being uncovered um, as the Christian world becomes sort of settled in Europe. And this is one of the major kind of uh, material factors uh, going into this, this moment is that as we're, we'll get into, there have been, you know, hundreds of years of turmoil in Italy and around Europe. And it's not like things are going to be, you know, smooth sailing from here on out. But 
as the church begins to establish itself as an institution and as the you know political uh, kind of uh, contours of Europe take shape, um, there is room for things to happen where like patrons can can emerge, um, where the churches can be built, um, and in times of relative stability, uh, we can start to realize well you know in in our efforts to establish a foothold for the church, we maybe lost some things that were true about pagan uh, visions, right? Pagan about the pagan idea of the world, and one of them was this order and harmony um, that that can be kind of brought out through art. And now it can be baptized because we don't just believe in gods fighting with one another. We actually believe in one God who really did create the world. Um, so let me read now. A, this, this is a passage from Pliny, um, whom we're going to get into more in a second. Um, this is Pliny's description of the of the Laocoon group. He says, in the case of several works of very great excellence, the number of artists that have been engaged upon them has proved a considerable obstacle to the fame of each. No individual individual being able to engross the whole of the credit and it being impossible to award it in due proportion to the names of the several artists combined. Such is the case with the Laocoon, for example, in the palace of the emperor Titus, a work that may be looked upon as preferable to any other production of the art of painting or of bronze statuary. It is sculptured from a single block, both the main figure as well as the children and the serpents with their marvelous folds. This group was made in concert by three most eminent artists, Agassander, Polydorus, and Athenodorus, natives of Rhodes. So we have actually, you know, a kind of proto art history here, an attribution uh, and a story, and also, you know, an identification of this as the pinnacle of sculpture. So similarly to Vasari, this way of evaluating things um, as being closer uh, to nature and to the essence of, of human truth. Um, this, you know, Pliny's survey is, uh, is uh, an important source for Vasari, as is a, you know, that of uh, Diodorus Siculus, kind of uh, another historian who talks a little bit about art. Um, but Pliny is really kind of the the key text for us, and we're gonna, as we move through this history uh, and move forward, we're gonna get into a little bit more of him in a bit. You know, he is um, he's this kind of Augustan era, you know, early Roman era uh, chronicler who catalogs. He's just, uh, it, the, the the work is called Natural History, and it's in book uh, 36 that he really kind of gets into art, although there are other books as well where this is, um, you know, it's various chapters in the book where he kind of gets into the history of art. And, and you know, why might this be a moment for, for art history to come into being, much as Vasari's moment is? Well, what's happening? We've just had this incredible period of turmoil, right, uh, that led eventually to the foundation of the Roman Empire, the fall of the Roman Republic, the, the rise of the empire. Um, and now we have this kind of new new era, this Augustan era of stability, uh, and, and, and somebody who kind of can travel throughout the world, um, as, as an owner of it, as a kind of, you know, uh, synoptic viewer of it, who says, yes, in Greece, there was this, and in, you know, in, in the, uh, far regions of, of Anatolia, there was this, and this kind of, um, look, surveying of the world is what Rome uh, becomes really good at, this sense of, of gathering all things unto itself, all roads lead to Rome, right? You've heard that before. And so the, the last thing that I want to do before we sort of break for a week, uh, and we'll come back and talk more about this as we go through, this is part of our sort of new format here on the show where we're going to take, you know, a, a, take the time that it takes to kind of go through this, this history and uh, go down some byways and build a vision of things so that when we get to people like Cimabue uh, and Duccio and Giotto, uh, we'll have, you know, a whole wealth of information to sort of co uh, compare it to and put it up against. Um, I, but I did just want to read to you before we leave, you know, and antiquity proper, um, before we start to move forward into the Byzantine era, I wanted to read to you some, some poems, uh, that describe sculptures that don't survive, uh, because I mentioned there's this, you know, intimate connection between the, the kind of realities that are conveyed, the verities, the truths that are conveyed by poetry and, uh, the truths that are conveyed by sculpture. And, you know, the friendships between painters and sculptors are going to become very important when we get to, you know, Vasari's account of the Dugento and so forth. Um, but there's, uh, there are a few things that we can glean from these works of what we would call ekphrasis. Now, ekphrasis, right, Greek word uh, meaning ek out of and phrasis speaking. So it's like when you kind of take a moment out of the narrative to just describe a work of art. Um, and this tradition ultimately informs, you know, some poems that are actually just written specifically only to describe a work of art. But like the core idea of this is from back in Homer uh, in book 18 of the Iliad, where, you know, Thetis, the mother of Achilles, uh, wants to send him back into battle and wants him to have good armor because he's lost the armor that he had, uh, having given it to Patroclus, who's now died. And Thetis goes to Hephaestus and she says, you know, please, can you make my son a great work of, you know, of armor? 
And Hephaestus says, yes, of course. Off he goes. And then the whole rest of the book almost, or a big, big chunk of the book, I should say, I don't want to exaggerate, but a big chunk of the book uh, is then just describing this armor and describing it in ways that almost can't possibly uh, be true, like that there, there's sort of motion going on on the shield. The shield of Achilles is the big, is the famous part uh, where there are cities depicted and kind of action. My favorite passage from from the Iliad is is in this ekphrasis, this long, long description of a work of art. Um, and why is it that that might have been a thing? Well, because you know, as we've been discussing, the kind of capture of uh, emotion and human action, uh, which happens in a poem, is analogous to what happens in a great work of art like the Laocoon, where you have this drama frozen in time and you can see the kind of motion captured in it, uh, that the human imagination is conveying that to you uh, through the stone. Um, and so you can very fitfully, fruitfully describe uh, these works in poetry um, as if they were alive. And this starts to become explicit in the in the Hellenistic era and as we move through the history of, of Greek poetry. Um, so here's a little, a little ekphrasis uh, from a poem by Theocritus, one of the great Hellenistic poets. Um, and Theocritus writes uh, these things that are now called idyls, which is where we get our word idyllic, but it just means, you know, a, um, a, a little kind of genre, like a little mini uh, version of some, some form of poetry. Um, and so this is kind of a, this one in particular is kind of a mini uh, comedy, a mini mime. Um, and it's Theocritus 15, it's called, it's sometimes called women at the Adonai, the festival of Venus and Adonis it takes place in, uh, Alexandria, which is sort of this big, uh, cultural and political hub of the Hellenistic world. Ptolemy II, you know, famous, uh, king in Egypt. And it's this interaction between these two women, uh, one of whom Praxinoa, uh, notices this sculpture, um, and, and this, uh, weaving, this engraving. And, and she sort of goes off on these little tangents about how beautiful, especially the weaving is. She says, um, housewife Athena, the weavers that, that made that material and the embroiderers who did that close detailed work are simply marvels. How realistically the things all stand and move about in it. They're living. It is wonderful what people can do. And then the holy boy, how perfectly beautiful he looks lying on his silver couch with the down of manhood just showing on his cheeks the thrice beloved Adonis, beloved even down below. Uh, now, this is, of course, the myth of uh, Venus and Adonis, that Venus fell in love with this mortal boy and he died and she kind of, uh, in her grief, produced a flower or, you know, the various different versions of the myth. Um, but this is a festival in honor of, of her and him, uh, this sort of semi, this divinized, you know, human being. Um, and, and the marvel for Praxinoa or Praxinoa, I guess is, is how you say it. The marvel for Praxinoa is, uh, is the, you know, the fact that these, these things are almost alive. Um, again, only something that matters, right? If you believe that life itself has a certain beauty uh, and form to it, right? The mere fact of existence, even when it's difficult, even when it's painful, even when there's sorrow, right? Is in itself a kind of beauty. Um, and this is a kind of low comic version of that same marvel that there exists beauty in the world that can be reproduced almost to the point of being alive. Um, this is something that is often said also about this famous sculpture of a cow uh, made by Myron. It does not survive. Um, but we get poems uh, kind of short poems about uh, how lifelike the cow looks, right? Either the whole skin of bronze is laid on top of this cow from without, or the bronze has a soul within. Interesting, those two ideas. Either, you know, you've taken the the, the material stuff and you've laid it onto the form, the hule onto the morphe, the, uh, the, the matter onto the form, or else the form has kind of breathed life into the matter. The soul within the bronze has sort of shaped it into a cow. Or in another one of these poems, this one anonymous, right? The cow molded the cow, bringing it forth from its womb, Myron did not fashion it. So this notion that it couldn't possibly be a human being, it must have been nature that created this thing. So this is the idea that we're working with here. Um, and it was very alive in antiquity, and it's starting to come back now uh, into uh, into modernity. And so we're going to, next next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about how, uh, you know, painting reached its height in antiquity. And then we'll talk about, you know, the, the history in between antiquity and, uh, and the Renaissance and how this stuff kind of uh, vanished from the world and then was gradually resurrected resurrected. Um, hope that this has been fun. I really love this stuff. And this is, you know, f feeding some of our hunger, I think, for, for visual art, because this has been missing from our, from the classical education. You didn't know you were being denied. Um, so we'll keep going with this. Uh, but for now, let's take a mailbag question.
One of the things I love about Gold River Trading Company, and I didn't know this, but they were founded to supply the American frontier. And that's something we've been talking about a lot on the show, the American spirit, right, of can-do attitude, uh, charging out into new frontiers. We are still doing that, even though uh, the country has basically taken the shape that it's taken. There's still a lot of endeavor uh, to be done. And uh, Young Heretics listeners are part of that. Gold River Trading Company is the place to go for good tea to fuel that project, the project of charging forth into the frontier. They make excellent tea, which is not easy to find in the States. Um, they have an American breakfast blend that I really love, um, but also gunpowder green tea if you're not quite that into uh, as all that caffeine. And if you don't want caffeine at all, they even have the uh, chamomile blend, which is also really delicious. All very well stocked and created. Um, goldrivercode.com is where you go, and you can get 10% off when you use the promo code Heretic. Six different blends, one loose leaf tea, one hot cocoa, all excellent. I have tried them. I do love them. And you can check them out at goldrivercode.com with 10% off when you use the offer code Heretics. Mailbag questions come to me on Locals. Locals is the exclusive community where VIPs can go deeper into this material. This is part of why I'm, I'm doing these episodes at all is because we've been going back and forth about, you know, the need for kind of more visual art in the show. Um, and you get to, you know, interact more directly with me. But then there's also, you know, a lot of extra stuff. Like I, I put out the episodes a week in advance with no ads, uh, which is really nice. We do weekly live streams. Um, and it's just a really fun and cool place to be because there's so much to talk about with this stuff that goes, you know, beyond the episodes into our own lives and 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 modern times. So uh, I would love for you to join us. It's part of how we uh, support the show and make it. It's uh, youngheretics.com forward slash locals to become a VIP. And I would say the annual membership is the best deal, although there is a monthly membership as well. Now let's take a mailbag question from Durand Athleta. What is the motivation for the modern art movement to make non-beautiful art? People seem agreed in general that this art is vapid um, and sort of ugly, but why isn't there more motivation to change it? Well, this is going to be part of the story of this series of episodes, and I think it has to do with exactly the thing that I said at the beginning, um, which is this notion that there is a divine uh, standard and that we're not just uh, inventing stuff out of our own heads. Now, human invention and imagination, as I've been saying, Saying, right, has an important role to play, um, but it's not the only role to play in art. And I think that once you lose the idea um, that there is a purpose behind the way things are, behind the way our lives are shaped, behind the way uh, creation works, behind science and how the uh, material laws of the universe work, right, uh, behind the formation of our minds, right, if once you lose the idea that all of that is constructed with a design in mind, um, then it becomes purely about what you know, humanity can invent. And eventually, you know, people get kind of bored, right? They get bored with just reproducing stuff uh, that, that they see in the world and they want to kind of strike out towards something different, but there may be nothing different, right, than, than God's creation. Um, and so it, it, it is true that eventually, as I said, you know, forms exhaust their potentiality, their possibilities. Uh, this will be the story that we tell as we go into the Byzantine period uh, with some of the mosaics that come from that era, right? Um, it does that does happen. And when that happens, uh, probably what it means is that God is calling us to a new way of seeing his order, right? So there's some sort of new form that's coming into being or new medium. Um, but the problem is that if you go into that new medium without a sense that you're doing something, that you're recreating uh, or reflecting back at God and at your fellow man, uh, the nature of divine order, um, then you're just going to end up kind of doing whatever uh, makes you feel pleasurable at a given time. And you see artists doing this now all the time. You see people like throwing stuff at walls and dripping, uh, you know, this is why people do this stuff like paint, uh, tape bananas to walls and uh, drip paint all over the floor. Like, you know, th there is a certain randomness to it because it's attempting, it's an effort essentially to move away from form. I mean, that's what abstraction is, right? It's sort of an attempt to uh, deny the some of the inherent structure in the world. And my suggestion would be that, you know, as we go forward into a new era of digital art, which we are doing, right? I and mean, as we talk about video games, as we talk about even like some of the stuff that people are just making using digital technology, you know, old paintings that are that are kind of um, redone and revitalized in, in digital art or paintings in the old style that are enhanced with, with digital technology, right? Um, 
our goal is going to be recovering that sense that this new tech too has a purpose, has a telos. Um, and that criterion or that touchstone of excellence is I think what we're missing with a sense that uh, you, you think that art is just a kind of you know, art for art's sake, it's a thing for itself. But this is a very unusual and modern idea that art is just this thing that we kind of do because it brings us pleasure. Um, the the truer idea is that art is informed by our entire philosophy of the world, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. That one sentence from the Psalms is enough to kind of describe how art, you know, ought to work. Uh, because if, if indeed the uh, physical stuff around us is so formed as to reflect God at us, um, then we must be so formed uh, with each new medium as to reflect the infinite abundance of God back at him. Uh, and so if, if you don't have that idea, right, all I'm afraid to say does come back to God, right? Like, why would we move away um, from, from doing that? Well, only if we felt that, like, that was somehow wrong, that we wanted to reject the notion that there's an inherent form in the world, um, and that instead we wanted just to kind of muddle up the forms and, and make something that, you know, resists any neat interpretation. Um, and that is kind of the movement of, of some of this modern abstraction. And, you know, some of it can can be powerful, I, I, I grant. You know, it's not like it has no value at all. Um, I happen to kind of like uh, Pollock and Rothko. Um, but in, in, in its essence, right, the, the problem is not that it doesn't necessarily always give me pleasure or that I don't always enjoy it. The problem is that the philosophy behind it is bad. And it's it's a degrading philosophy that will eventually degrade the products of, of the human imagination. Um, and so God is always the key. It's always going to be God uh, that gives the shape to the world that we then invest into new forms of art. Um, so there are people who are doing that. I mean, people, conservatives are making art and not just conservatives because it's not really just about a political thing, but people that, you know, are connected to some idea of, of order in the world are doing this. Um, but it takes time, right, to recover that sort of thing. Um, and it takes effort. So hopefully we'll get into more of that as we go uh, through this history Thank you for listening to the show. This is so much fun for me to do, as always. Um, and if you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute, where I work. It's a think tank for the recovery for the American of the American idea. Uh, we put out two publications, the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind. You can find them both online, and you can get the CRB in your mailbox in a dead tree version, which I do recommend. Uh, you can go and subscribe, or you can donate at claremont.org slash donate. Um, and please do uh, check out also our feeds if you haven't already subscribed to this show. If you like what we're doing, and you want to catch the new episodes that we put out about the, you know, the rest of the history of art leading up to uh, the Renaissance, then uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and come join us. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Mm -hmm.